In this lesson, we are going to analyze the conservation of momentum equation. The equation is just a restatement of the Newton's second law and connects the variation of momentum of the system with the forces acting on it. The equation can be easily used to analyze how the fluid is subject to external forces or creates them interacting with solid boundaries. For example, in internal combustion engine, we have that the combustion creates a sudden increase of pressure and temperature in the fluid. The high pressure of the fluid pushes back the piston inside the cylinder, creating the motion that makes cars and trucks move. So let's now start and analyze the conservation of momentum. Starting from the Lagrangian form of the equation, we can use the Reynolds transport theorem to convert the equation into the Eulerian framework. Then we apply the divergence theorem to recast the surface integral into volume integrals. Note that in this equation we have two terms in the right hand side that are the surface forces and the body forces acting on the fluid. The surface forces are generated by pressure and viscous stresses. The tau term in the viscous stresses force is called viscous stress tensor. If we consider a fluid element, the pressure acts normal to the surface, while the viscous stresses act both normal and tangential to the surface. Using the divergence theorem, we can transform the two terms into volume integral form. Note that for the pressure force, the result is just a direct consequence of the divergence theorem. Let's analyze now the second term on the right side of the momentum equation. The body forces act on the volume of the fluid and they can be expressed as a body force per unit volume, integrated over the volume. An example of body force is the one due to the gravitational acceleration field. Now, substituting the expressions we just derived for the surface and the body forces into the momentum equation, we can obtain the equation in terms of volume integral. Then we can assume that the control volume is arbitrary. Hence, the integrands must be equal to zero to satisfy the conservation equation. The equation is then reduced in its differential form. Note that the momentum equation is a vector equation. This means that in Cartesian coordinates, we will have three different equations, one for the x direction, one for the y direction, and one for the z direction. In a three-dimensional field, the stress tensor is a three by three matrix, composed by these nine components that are unknown. In order to close the problem, we could derive nine additional governing equations, one for each of these terms. Or we can follow the approach introduced by Navier and then refined by Stokes and express the viscous stress tensor components in terms of the flow variables. In particular, we will connect them to velocity components and close the problem without the need of extra equations. The results of this approach are the Navier-Stokes equation, that are the governing equation of fluid dynamics. Let's analyze the assumptions that Navier and Stokes used for the viscous stress tensor. The first one is to assume that no viscous stresses are generated by pure translation and rigid body rotation. The second one is that the fluid has to be isotropic. 
meaning that the properties are the same independently of the direction used to measure them. Next is the fluid to be Newtonian. The viscous stresses are linearly proportional to the strain rate and are related by a viscosity term independent on the stress rate and the flow velocity. The last assumption is that the viscous stress force acts only tangentially, meaning that its normal component to the surface is zero. This means that only the pressure acts normal to the boundaries, while the viscous stresses act only tangentially. Under these assumptions, we obtain this final expression for the viscous tensor, reported here in the Cartesian coordinates. Mu is the dynamic viscosity. Epsilon is the strain rate tensor that describes the rate of change of the fluid element. And delta ij is the Kronecker delta. We can then substitute this expression into the conservation of momentum equation. This form of the equation is typically referred as the non-conservative form or convective form of the momentum equation. We can expand the equation into the full 3D form for all the components to have a reference point for subsequent modeling. Removing the terms connected to the z-direction and the last equation, we can recast these equations in their b-dimensional version. Another form of the equation is the conservative form shown here. The conservative and the non-conservative forms are mathematically equivalent for differentiable flow fields. The conservative form of the equations is generally applied for computational fluid dynamics. So, now let's take a look at what we have so far. Four differential equations, one continuity equation and three momentum equations. And we have five unknowns, density, three components of velocity and pressure. If we assume that the fluid is incompressible, the density is constant and is no more an unknown. If also the viscosity can be assumed constant, we can actually close the system of equations and uh, the mathematical model can be solved. If density and viscosity are not constant, let's say they are a function of temperature, then we need at least one additional equation to resolve the model. The energy equation will let us analyze the temperature that is tied to pressure and density through a state equation, like, for example, the idea gas law. In this lecture, we analyzed how to derive the momentum equation. This equation gives us a direct link between the momentum variation and the forces acting on the fluid. We also analyzed the viscous stress tensor and the assumptions introduced by Navier and Stokes. The next step is to introduce the energy equation and close the mathematical model.